Uh, the, the final speaker will be Lisa Helps, the Victoria City Councillor, and she'll be talking about municipal governance issues. They have computers and fancy PowerPoint presentations. I have a book, a notebook, and one slide. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Andrew for inviting us all here tonight to thank uh, Richard and Chris for their comments. But most importantly to me, to thank all of you. Um, obviously, as we saw by someone who stood up and said, wait a minute, that's not the right handout that you're referring to. This is a very, very charged issue. It's an emotional issue. It's an economical issue, it's an environmental issue, and it's a really, really important issue. So I want to, I'm not gonna talk about uh, technicalities or engineering, although I'm gonna share one idea that I learned recently. What I wanna do is talk about the question that I was asked to answer, which is what can local councils and elected officials do to ensure that CRD residents get the best possible plan? Obviously, um, most of you know I'm not on the CRD, I'm a Victoria councillor, so I've been watching from the sidelines. Um, but even before I was elected as a Victoria councillor, I thought that the project needed some second thought. And we've already heard about some of the reasons why. I think we can do better with resource recovery, and I think we can do better with a long-term approach. Now the handout that we got tonight that I read while these folks were talking, because I've already heard what they have to say, um, says that the, this plan, myth and fact, it's, it's a myth um, that this plan that's proposed won't allow us to treat our water and sewage for the long term. It says that we will progressively treat water for the next 60 to 80 years. Um, that's what this plan will allow us to do. And that's okay, that's not bad. But I think we still need to take a different look in terms of innovation and in terms of the long term. What if we build a system that generates revenue and creates usable water, water and usable energy for the long term? I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So what can elected officials do at this juncture in the project? I think we can do three things. We can listen to residents. We can vote to extend the timeline. And we can take an approach that moves beyond sustainability. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment, because I think that to me that's one of the most important opportunities to seize in this moment. Um, can I have some water and not the stuff in the jar? <laughs> I know Richards assured me that I could drink the um, water from Dockside, but the jury's still out on that. So first of all, um, not that it's not very clean, I'm sure. Listening to residents, number one thing that we can do. I hear a lot, we say a lot, boy, the public is apathetic. Boy, we wish voter turnout would increase. Boy, we wish the public would be more engaged. And then on this issue, when the public gets very engaged, when we have these people, well not Andrew, he's not a volunteer, but when we have Richard and Chris who are spending their days and nights volunteering to come up with not just an opposition to this plan, but an alternate to the plan, the right plan, they're proposing something and we say, we, I feel like we see them a little bit as a pain in the ass, like I wish they'd just stop, let us get on with this, we need to build this plan, stop getting in our way. But they're engaged. And so I think we as elected officials need to take this very seriously and to listen. Because the goal for all of us, every single person here, whether you think this is the plan to go ahead with or whether you think we need to extend the timeline to 2020 and look at something a little bit different, the goal is to create the best possible plan. And I think if every single person, whether you oppose the plan or support the plan, and most importantly, if you're elected official at the CRD that's going to be making a decision about the plan, we need to listen to everybody and move forward in a way, again, that looks for the long term, not just about sustainability, but about abundance. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's the number one thing we can do. Listen to residents. Don't see people who are spending their time as a pain in the ass. We wish they'd just shut up and sit down and let us get on with the plan. That's not the right approach. Second thing we can do is extend the timeline. 
As Andrew has already pointed out, some of the timelines are not even set in stone, and it's a political process, and we are the residents of this region. It is our responsibility to ask the province and ask the federal government if we need more time, which I believe we do, which a number of people believe we do, give us that time so we can work out the plan that's the best for the region and the people who are paying for it for the long term. So I wanted to take a moment here to publicly acknowledge Marianne Alto, colleague at the CRD, as well as two CRD alternates from Victoria, Chris Coleman and Pam Madoff, who are bringing this motion forward. I think there's two key factors that you're all probably aware of about this being the moment where we can press the pause button. One, there's no contract awarded, thank goodness. And two, the land for the proposed project isn't rezoned. So there are two key hurdles that haven't yet been passed. And I think if we're not gonna do it now, we're going to march forward in a way that doesn't serve our residents the best way that we can. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. That's where I'll focus the majority of my remarks. So I've talked about what elected officials can do. Vote to extend the timeline. Listen to residents. What can you do? Well, you're already doing something. You're here and you're engaged. But you can go and talk to everyone you know and everyone who might be interested and get them to talk, get them to come to forums, hold workshops. There is so much information. Chris could spend hours talking about this and we still wouldn't know everything we need to know. It's our responsibility to listen. It's your responsibility to keep asking us and CRD staff for balanced information because it's only with all of the information in hand that we're even going to be able to make sense of this as elected officials, but also as residents. So you can stay engaged, you can keep talking about this, don't just come to this forum and then go home and hope that we're all gonna do our best at the CRD table, we need you as well to be part of this. All right, this is where to me it gets exciting and inspiring. If we press the pause button, and someone handed me that piece of paper as I was walking in and they said, we're with a group who just wants to see this done. We just want this to get done. And you know what? So do I. But I don't just want it to get done in the same old way. We can aspire to more than that. There's kind of a notion that with these large infrastructure projects, once they're underway, we just can't stop or we're gonna lose money, we're gonna million dollars a month, all of these figures start getting tossed around and it generates fear and a desire as people, again, who are paying for this, well, maybe we should just move it forward. We don't wanna waste our money if we don't, you know, maybe this is okay, but I don't think it is okay. Because sustainability is important, but we can do better than just sustainability. Um, so I'm going to turn now to talk a little bit about uh, this book called The Upcycle, Beyond Sustainability, Designing for Abundance. And if you really want a, uh, a lens through which to view this project and to view a lot of the way that I think cities and regions need to move in the 21st century, have a look at this book. I'm not going to get into the details uh, about it or of it, but I do want to look at the sewage treatment project through this notion or this lens of designing for abundance. And this designing for abundance, moving beyond sustainability and designing for abundance is important politically in terms of the sewage treatment project, but it's also important economically. Politically, if, this, if the public insists and if CRD board decides to pause the project and take a little bit of a different approach. Some of the things that Chris and Richard have pointed out, we need to recover energy, we need to recover water, and we need to make money. Recover energy, recover water, and make money. Not just treat sewage and then pump pretty clean water back out into the ocean. So if the CRD will press the pause button and take this approach, designing for abundance, and I'm gonna talk about what that exactly means in a moment, I think that we can do something really profound we can get some key champions of sewage treatment, the David Suzuki Foundation and the Georgia Strait Alliance to come on board with pausing and looking for a better plan. And economically, as this simple diagram shows, 
sewage treatment, which le leads to cost and liability, if we reframe and look at it as nutrient recovery, this leads to income and assets. I almost want to skip to what I mean by designing for abundance, but that's the punchline at the end, so I'm going to save that. Uh, and I'm going to just talk about one idea that, um, as an example of how we move from sewage treatment, which is a cost and a liability, to nutrient recovery, which is uh, income and assets, generates income and, and generates assets. And it's very briefly uh, the story of um, phosphates. Anyone who grows food or anyone who farms soil or anyone who knows, any, knows anything about growing things, we know that phosphate is a key nutrient that's needed to grow anything at all uh, that we eat or, or enjoy the beauty of. Um, Large-scale agricultural farming, uh, basically the way that food is produced depletes phosphates from the soil altogether. And I'll tell you why I'm talking about phosphates, it's because they actually can be produced from poo. And uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. And there's a company in Vancouver that's working on that technology. So mined, the traditional way that we get phosphates is by mining phosphates. Um, largest supplier of phosphates is China. Second largest supplier of phosphates is the United States. Um, there's a high market demand for phosphates because that is, again, how we grow everything we need to eat. Uh, and there's a market shortage. So for example, in 2010, there was such a shortage uh, in China that they kept all of their, almost all of their phosphates produced locally to grow food locally and put 110% tariff on phosphates to be exported. So there was a shortage. So then the United States had to step up its production and mining of phosphates in order to meet world demand. So why am I talking about phosphates? I'm going to read to you now from this book. Uh, and this is where this diagram comes from. A company in Vancouver, British Columbia, so not, not anywhere far away, is developing ways to recover phosphate from human waste. An engineer at the sewage company had been studying the problem of waste pipes clogging due to the crystallization of minerals in the pipes, a liability. The engineer attempted to get the crystallized mineral out, but this proved very hard, literally, because the minerals were stone-like. So the engineer came up with a mechanical device and a small chemical intercession. The mechanical device created a vortex, a swirl, spinning the water so the minerals wouldn't cling to the pipes. What happened then? The minerals came out as pearls of phosphate. Okay, so we've got this technology developed right across the street. These pellets of magnesium ammonium phosphate are known as struvite, and for farmers, they're ideal because they release their nutrients slowly, taking about eight to nine months to fully dissolve. They feed into soil at a pace that plants can digest, and the farmers don't have to keep laboring to add phosphate since for eight to nine months, they know the fields have their fill. Okay, the next thing in the book is this diagram that I'm sure you've all been waiting to know the context for, so that's what happens there. The sewage treatment plant, which had defined sewage as a problem to be contained, could now become a nutrient management system, capturing phosphate to feed soil. Yesterday's cost became today's coin. So again, I'm not suggesting that the CRD abandon all its plans and start treating phosphates. What I am, or creating phosphates, what I am suggesting is there is technology out there right now and very close to home that says we can do better than we are doing. All right, so the moment you've all been waiting for, at least the moment I've been waiting for, what is this designing for abundance? What does that mean and how is it applicable here? We hear that we need to treat our sewage because it's environmentally sound, it's the sustainable thing to do. Sustainability is absolutely key. We must treat our sewage because it's sustainable. And I want to say that that's not good enough. And I'm going to go back to this book again if I might. I feel like I'm reading a bedtime story. Even though environmental efforts are often well-meaning, ecologism, environmentalism taken to the extreme, can be tyrannical. Its laws only mandate that we save energy and water, minimizing the negative effects of poor design. In other words, greenwashing the dirty laundry, or water, a bit. Think about attempting to fall in love less wastefully. 
Or what about an efficient child or an efficient childhood? Terrible, right? Children and childhood can be, and we prefer them to be, full of richness, diverse enjoyments, fruitfulness, digressions, wanderings, imagination, and creativity. Who would want a simply sustainable marriage? Humans can certainly aspire to more than that. In all of life, people can think big. So how do we design for abundance? How do we create a sewage treatment plan and system that's going to serve the residents of this region for the long term? We start with a statement of intention. And if we look at all of the media coverage with the statement of intention, for the, or the, if we look at all of the media coverage of the current sewage treatment plan, we might say or guess that the statement of intention went something like this. We have to treat our sewage because upper levels of government told us to do it and it's the right thing to do for the environment and we need to do it in a way that will cost taxpayers as little money as possible in the short term. Not bad, that's okay. But what about this? And again, here's where I think there's room to draw together all of the sides that want the right plan, that want a good plan. The David Suzuki Foundation, the Georgia Strait Alliance, some people in this room who handed me that handout when I came in. What if this is our intention? Let's design and build a sewage treatment slash nutrient recovery system that generates revenue and an abundance of usable energy and water for the short, the medium, and the long term. What if we do that? So to, oh, okay, yeah, I think yeah, that's great. So I'm gonna conclude now because we're really here not only to share our ideas but to tell you or to listen to what you have to tell us. So what can CRD officials do to recap? Listen to residents, extend the deadline to 2020, and set a new project, set a new intention for the project. And if not, now, then when? We are building this infrastructure for our children and for their children. And we need to get it right for the long term. We really do, and all of us, every single person in this room, whether you're opposed or not to the current plan, we have a responsibility and an opportunity at this moment to do something a little bit different. Thank you.